In this video, I'll be going over the design of a slewing bearing and how I created one in SolidWorks, why I created one, what a slewing bearing is used for, and hopefully you can learn something from this video, um, whether it be some information about bearings or just general SolidWorks design and manufacturing. So let's jump into it. So looking at this animation here, we can see that this slewing bearing has um, an inner gear which is mounted to an inner ring and that's been driven by a small gear in the center. That creates a, a rotational motion relative to this stationary outer ring and that motion is um, achieved through these bearings. These are steel balls which are rolling as opposed to sliding which decreases friction. So looking at some examples of slewing bearings, they're essentially heavy duty bearings which are used in applications such as within cranes or windmills. Just um, any heavy duty application where there's a large, a large load, uh, specifically a large moment. So just looking at this um, data sheet from SKF, I'll just going to the beginning, uh, beginning of it. SKF are a manufacturer of bearings, so um, you can buy a lot of um, off-the-shelf slewing bearings and whatnot from them. But in this specific uh, data sheet, there's quite a bit of good information. So I'll just quickly run through here. So in this diagram, they're just explaining the components of a slewing bearing. So an inner ring, an outer ring. In this case, gear teeth are cut directly into the outer ring and they have steel balls and some plastic spaces and also some seals. So in my uh, application, I've left out the seals. The seals are there to um, keep dirt and whatnot out and also retain lubrication fluid. And the plastic spaces, I'll discuss them more a bit later. But just looking at these diagrams quickly, they demonstrate the um, types of loads slewing bearings can take. So essentially because it's, it's a ring, the balls are a larger distance away from the central axis. So it means that the uh, counter moment or the counter torque provided by the bearing can be larger. So just looking at an example, I think they're stating here that this excavator is uh, mounted on a slewing bearing, which allows for 300 degree, 360 degrees of rotation. And here just looking at some pictures of some slewing bearings, which I may come back to. So jumping straight into my design, just when it loads up. So just removing this cross section view. So essentially, in um, a project I was working on at a job in the past, uh, I had to design a slewing bearing because there was nothing off the shelf that was suitable for the needs of the project. Essentially, it was a medium scaled robot and it needed to have an element of rotation and support quite a significant load, but we were quite restricted on the space we had available. So I spent a good while searching if there were slewing bearings I could just buy and adapt, but unfortunately they were all a bit too big. So I just decided to um, make some designs and get some components machined out of aluminium. So I'll just quickly show you a cross section of the complete model. So I just change the plane that we're looking at. So here we can see this outer piece, it's fairly straightforward. I'll just open this up. Um, it's basically just a cylindrical piece of aluminium and it has a V-shaped groove cut in it. I'll just take a cross section so you can see this V-shaped groove quite easily. So this is the area that will contain the steel balls. And I've made this groove slightly larger than the steel balls themselves. So just quickly showing you um, some theory. So this is some lecture notes from MIT on bearings. And it's just going through some of the theory on um, how the cross-sectional um, shape can affect the contact footprint between the steel balls and the um, adjacent material and how that can affect the percentage of slip and whatnot. But in my case, um, the main reason I decided to go for a V-shaped groove instead of a semicircular groove is because a V-shaped groove would be easier to um, 
specify to manufacturers exactly what I want um, and it would just be easier to get right. Whereas I've going, if I was going for a cross-sectional groove, um, that would be harder to machine and um, more things could go wrong. So I'll quickly come back and touch on this again a bit later. But besides that, this piece, uh, the only other features it has are some holes for some countersunk screws. So screws going through this end will stick out here and they could mount into whatever, um, whatever you wanted essentially like whether that be a chassis of um, a larger assembly or some other component. So now looking at the steel balls, these are just uh, eight millimeter steel balls and it's a bit difficult to see here, but um, there is a bit of clearance between the steel balls. So obviously if we assemble this thing to be, you know, perfect 100% fit, um, in the real world, nothing is 100% perfect. So in mechanical design, you always want some clearance and tolerancing. So I believe I left about a 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 millimeter gap um, between the steel balls and the, the contact points. And I'll, I'll quickly come back to that a bit later and show you. So looking at the uh, inside pieces now, um, the inner ring just going back to the assembly quickly, the inner ring has to be split up into two pieces for assembly because if it, um, if it was just a single piece, there would be no way of assembling the steel balls in, in between, in the groove. So I'll just remove that section. So we have an upper component of the inner ring which is that blue highlighted section there and we also have a lower component of the inner ring which is that blue section highlighted there so these two sections are held together by screws which are going through holes in both and those screws actually also come and mount into this gear here so just quickly going through everything so you have a rough idea um, this is one half of the inner ring. Um, the other half is essentially identical, except it also has a cutout for the gear to sit into. And the gear is just a flanged gear that looks like this. And I'll, I'll explain um, how you can manufacture this gear and the process I use to get this made. So let me just look at my notes quickly. So yeah, I explained um, and sometimes you might have to design a component because there's nothing um, that you could buy off the shelf that's suitable for your needs. In this case, um, because we're using gears, it's not really desirable to have to design your own gears and get your own gear teeth cut. It, um, it's fairly expensive to get gear teeth cut and um, getting it accurate and whatnot and getting the teeth hardened because... Um, gear teeth have to be relatively like hard hard material like hardened steel if you were to make them out of a soft metal like aluminium they wouldn't be able to withstand much torque because the teeth would just deform under a heavy load so <clears throat> i was aware of um companies such as khk gears which is a japanese gear manufacturer and they have a whole range of gears so i knew i needed an internal spur gear and also a drive gear to match that. So this was the internal spur gear and this is the um, drive gear. So this drive gear in my scenario was mounted to a motor. So as this rotates, it drives the whole system around, as you can see there like that, while the outer ring is stationary, it's static. So KHK, um, and you know, keep in mind, this is just an example. There are you know a whole number of uh, gear manufacturers out there but essentially um on their website you can specify some parameters such as you know the outside diameter number of teeth etc and using that i found um a suitable set of gears for my purposes so i believe this gear here um and if you open if you click on it it gives you a link to download this model so I downloaded this gear as a step file which is a standard 3d format and actually see if I can just open up that step file for you quickly um, so you can 
see the base file. So once you download the step file from the website and open it up, this is what it would look like. Um, so this is essentially what you would get if you were to purchase this gear of uh, KHK. And this this would be you know relatively cheap, maybe one or two hundred um, American dollars. But the issue now is how do we integrate this into the rest of our design? So um, I'm just going to hide this gear quickly. So I've got limited space to work with and obviously that gear is quite chunky. So we need to make some modifications to the gear. So um, I'll just show the modifications I've done. So basically removed a whole bunch of material. Um, and created a flange and some through holes for some some bolts to go through and that allows us to interface the existing KHK gear with our current design and when I purchased this uh, internal gear the, dri the drive gear the critical thing you need to make sure is that the module is the same. So if two gears have the same module, it means that they will mesh and they can link up together. And then the number of teeth and diameter, that's just going to affect the, uh, the gear ratio and the mechanical advantage and whatnot. So to get those modifications made to that gear are somewhat difficult because gears tend to be case hardened, which means they go through a heat treatment process to make the teeth hard um, and hardened steel is quite difficult to machine because essentially it's it's the same or similar hardness to drill bits or mill bits so sometimes tungsten carbide cutters have to be used so in the past I've actually got gear manufacturers manufacturers to make modifications to gears um, themselves and they'll just charge an additional fee but by all means um, you could get a, a workshop, a, a local workshop for you perhaps to um, make modifications. Just keep in mind that it is difficult machining hard and steel. So with that in mind, that gives um, a rough idea of the majority of the components here. And I think I'll just try get a better view just to um, emphasize the clearance I was discussing before. Um, Sorry, just bear with me one second here. So before I'd mentioned um, some clearance between balls and the aluminium pieces. So it seems I actually have a small mating mistake. I haven't 100% finished this model. But essentially you want to leave a very small gap uh, between the steel balls and the outer pieces. And that's just some mechanical clearance. Um, because it's better to have things slightly too loose than too compressed where to the point where it's not going to work um, and it's not going to rotate. Another spot you can see where we have some clearance is just between here. So this is the inner ring um, moving relative to the static out outer ring and we've just got a couple mil of clearance there. So I'll just measure that. So we have an exact number. So 0 0.35 millimeters essentially. Um, so to send these components off for manufacturing, um, you may buy these gears from a gear supplier and um, send some drawings with the uh, machining modifications you want. These pieces, um, the aluminium pieces, you would send a step file to a, a machinist workshop or, you know, an overseas um, manufacturer. And with that step file, you would also send a drawing. So I don't actually have a drawing of this piece, but a similar piece is something like this. So in this drawing, you just specify areas of critical dimensions. Um, areas that really have to be within a certain range you want to specify in your drawing. So for example, um, if the steel balls were going to sit inside this area here, this is our V-shaped groove, we want to make sure that our angle is fairly accurate. And also um, in some cases we want things to be slightly bigger or slightly smaller depending on the geometry. And you can use things like say um, 
175.95 millimeters plus 0 minus 0 0.1 so that's giving the range that the dimension can be within and they, these are just some things you have to think about um, when you're designing an, an assembly um, for it to work so just one more time to show you um, some information about mechanical tolerancing so here I've got my V groove and um, I said before I was using 8 millimeter balls but I actually found a manufacturer that supplies 7.9 millimeter steel balls but in my design I still use the dimension of 8 millimeters so that when I come with the 7.9 millimeter ball there's a little bit of clearance in here and uh, that's not the most exact way to do it there are you know guidelines you should follow but just to give you a rough idea, that's um, how some mechanical tolerancing works. So to finish that off, this um, slew bearing might be mounted to, you know, some static piece or some large robotic arm or some kind of crane or windmill or heavy duty application. And you could have a, another drive motor that is mounted to this gear, which will rotate this around. Um, and you could add more features in here to make this, you know, a waterproof, more compact system. This is just really a, a rough guide, a rough introduction. And even if you wanted to experiment with this stuff, um, you could 3D print all these components, uh, except the steel balls. You can't really 3D print an uh, accurate ball, but you could 3D print the outer and inner rings, um, even 3D print the gears, and then just purchase some steel balls. Obviously, a 3D printed version won't be as accurate and won't be able to take um, anywhere near as much load. But it would still be um, good for any small hobby project. So I might actually leave these files in the description for people to 3D print if they're interested to. I might even have a go at 3D printing this myself and demonstrating that in a future video. So hope you enjoyed this video and learned something. Um, leave a thumbs up or leave a comment if you want me to model anything else or if you have any questions you'd like me to answer and subscribe to the channel for more videos in the future. Thanks for watching and have a good day.